Welcome to the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar is entitled, An Update on Mandatory Health Workforce Data Collection in New Hampshire. And it was presented by Daniel Weiss. Hello, my name is Morgan Clifford, and our presenter today, Daniel Weiss, will be giving us an update on mandating health workforce data collection in New Hampshire. At the end, she's gonna be answering a few questions, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to her. Daniel? Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm gonna to talk about an update to the legislative process to collect healthcare workforce data in New Hampshire. I presented on the subject around this same time last year, so it is gonna be a quick recap and then where we are now. The long and winding road. Um, last year I did share this slide because we weren't quite where we wanted to be, and I'm sharing it again because we're still not. So at the end of 2017, after four years of state effort, the New Hampshire legislature passed House Bill 322, um, which gave the Health Professions Licensing Board statutory authority to require survey completion by providers during license renewal cycles. But this bill has a loophole that states completion is not a condition for license renewal. As you can imagine, this has presented a whole host of challenges that we'll, we're gonna get into. Um, so today, I'm, I'm gonna cover a little background to bring the audience up to speed, how the bill language came to be, challenges we've encountered as a result of the legislative language, possible solutions to increase the response rate, and the essential variables that we believe are necessary to be successful for um, to be successful in this project. A little background here. So the 2008 statute establishing the Legislative Commission on Primary Care Workforce Issues, and that's a mouthful, so I'm going to just refer to it as the commission from here on, um, charges the New Hampshire State Office of Rural Health, or the SOAR, to collect data on the current and anticipated supply of primary care providers. Rural health and primary care under which the SOAR lives went to work developing a health professions data center, also known as the data center. And side note here, the data center is really just me working with stakeholders to develop and test surveys, to implement surveying with the licensing boards, um, collecting data using Qualtrics software, and analyzing and releasing reports. So I'm really the one-stop shop here. The commission is to use this data in annual workforce reports to guide their work, but as you can imagine, they haven't really been able to do this. So um, rural health and primary care also houses the primary care office, or the PCO, which is federally required to identify and process federal shortage designations. Now shortage designations bring providers and grant funding to underserved areas of the state most of which are, are rural because this is New Hampshire and over 80% of our land is rural. Because HRSA, the agency which administers the shortage designation branch, recently changed provider validation by using the MPI database, PCOs must now prove that providers are not working 40 hours a week, which is the MPI default, and our office just doesn't have a way of doing this without surveying. So this initiative directly affects our shortage designation process in the state. Um, but we developed the data center to offer more than just provider validation. We wanted to provide workforce data for our stakeholders so the state can be successfully, um, I'm sorry, so the state can successfully perform healthcare access planning and workforce assessment activities. The survey will be used to strengthen recruitment and retention initiatives, including scholarships, loan repayment and waiver programs. It can enhance emergency preparedness, and it can motivate the development or expansion of existing educational programs and employment training programs. So as an example, the commission has been working to coordinate efforts to establish a rural residency, or at least a track with rural rotations, and plans to use physician workforce data to pursue this. The analysis that I just did of the 2018 physician data found that rural practicing physicians were more than three times as likely to have attended a New Hampshire residency than non-rural physicians. This really means that New Hampshire residency could result in more rural providers. So data like this can make the difference when applying for a grant or getting support for a new initiative. Um, background continued. So there were many setbacks prior to accomplishing survey legislation in 2017. Initially following the advice of the executive director of the Board of Medicine at the time, we pursued an administrative rules change. 
but that was rejected by an oversight committee. Then we tried to include the survey as an amendment to, um, to the commission extension bill, but that was rejected by the Senate chair. And this chair wasn't pleased that the committee, which oversees board administrative concerns and of which she was actually um, chair of, wasn't informed. There's also been a misinformation, high turnover, lengthy timelines, and a reorg at the Division of Health Professions now under the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, or OPLC. Um, and this is why it really took us close to four years to get any survey legislation on the books. So finally in, 2000, in June 2017, the governor signed House Bill 322 authorizing participating health professions licensing boards to adopt rules requiring licensees to complete the health workforce survey during license renewal cycles. And this is for each renewal cycle. As I mentioned, the bill passed in the Senate with an amendment to the requirement which states the survey is not a condition of licensure. So it, that basically strips the bill of a, of a true requirement. And unfortunately, we had to accept this amendment in order to get the bill passed at all. The Senate chair was concerned the requirement could prevent license renewal for a fully competent provider and could deter providers from wanting to practice in New Hampshire. However, she also did understand New Hampshire's desperation for data um, and supported our efforts to collect it. So this was an attempt to strike a balance where language would include the word requirement as long as it was clarified that incompletion would not prevent license renewal. Survey implementation. So since the legislation passed, the following health professions licensing boards have adopted rules to implement surveying. Uh, the Board of Medicine for Physicians and PAs, the Board of Nursing for APRNs, the Board of Mental Health Practice for clinical social workers, mental health counselors, marriage and family therapists, and pastoral psychotherapists, Board of Alcohol and Other Drug Use Professionals for um, LADACs and MLADACs, and Board of Psychologists. So implementing surveying with the boards has been a really tedious process. The OPLC wanted one rule to be adopted for every participating board, so it had to be accepted by each board. The board is stretched then, or the office is stretched then, and always inundated with legal matters, so the timeline for implementation continued to be pushed back. We just met the deadline for the Board of Nursing this past cycle, and to meet the deadline for the Board of Medicine renewal cycle, we actually had to establish an interim rule to avoid the lengthy rules process. Um, and in the middle of all of this, um, the OPLC lawyer left, and now the new lawyer, who we have yet to formally meet, needs to tie up loose ends. We still need the rules in place for the Board of Psychologists and need to present to the Board of Dental Examiners for Dentists and Dental Hygienists. Bill language ramifications. So as you can imagine, there have been several drawbacks to using the word requirement and words not a condition of license renewal in the same bill and rule. Uh, there continues to be inconsistent communication regarding the survey coming from the licensing boards and mainly the Board of Medicine. Although our office, with facilitation from the OPLC director, distributed guidance on how to respond to specific questions regarding the survey, I found from being forwarded emails from providers that the administrators simply tell providers not to worry about completing the survey and they'll still get their license renewed. And unfortunately, there's not really much we can do about this, but encourage the administrators to follow the guidance and reiterate why this data collection is so important. The setback can even bias responses because large hospital system administrators reach out on behalf of physicians in their unit to the Board of Medicine. Um, so telling these administrators the survey is not necessary to complete could ultimately affect the response rate for a large portion of providers that represent entire regions of New Hampshire. There's obviously considerable confusion among providers who then reach out for clarification on whether survey completion is a requirement. And of course, I'm the one um, who has to communicate this requirement, and of course I have difficulty doing so. And I just try to use appropriate language to stress that yes, the survey is a legislative requirement because that's the exact language used in the bill. I only explain that no, it won't affect renewal of the license if they specifically ask if it's a condition of renewal. But it is a balancing act to communicate the statute the correct way. 
And so what have we seen with the response rate throughout the years is that when strong requirement language was used and survey completion was communicated as a condition of renewal, 88% of physicians completed it, and this was in 2015. Um, this was before the commission reauthorization bill hit the Senate executive session and the survey amendment was struck from the bill. So we found out prior to the close of the renewal cycle that the survey couldn't be a condition of renewal. So the language dropped before renewals closed, which is obviously why the response rate wasn't even higher than 88%. In 2016, when no requirement language was used, the response rate was 7%, um, and the data was obviously largely unusable. And even though in 2017 we surveyed the same cohort of physicians, surveyed in 2015, um, and this is because the Board of Medicine splits physicians into two groups for renewals, which occur every two years, we only got a 44% response rate. And this last renewal cycle, when contradictory language was used, the response rate was 57%. So, I mean, just with the stats here, this is really a clear demonstration of how critical it is to have survey completion tied to license renewal with a true requirement. Next step, so what are the next steps to keep improving data collection? Something we just presented to the Board of Medicine and which will be incorporated in the next round of renewals is the incorporation of an active practice status question on the physician and PA renewal page. This question is actually noted as a requirement in the Board of Medicine rules apart from our survey, but was never implemented. The Board of Medicine was using the state indicated from the physician's last business address to point to practice status, which obviously isn't an accurate representation. So even if providers were only maintaining their license and not practicing, they could be teaching or even retired, indicating New Hampshire residents would put them in an active practice category. So the addition of this question would allow the data center to start with an accurate panel of survey participants and prevent following up with physicians and PAs not contributing to the workforce. It would remove the guesswork around incompletion, you know, wondering if incompletion was because the survey was irrelevant to them because they're not, because they're inactive, and help our office and the Board of Medicine determine the number of active physicians and PAs in New Hampshire and provide that information to stakeholders. It would also give us an accurate denominator to work with for shortage designation work. So um, the last bullet here, what, what's most exciting is we're really hoping to improve the legislation this year to cut out the voluntary loophole. So we're hoping to have a true requirement of survey or opt-out completion. And this is actually being pursued on our behalf by um, the Primary Care Association by state and a huge multi-million dollar workforce bill. So what are the variables we found are necessary for workforce survey implementation success? Because the board administrators are stretched thin, it was always important to the boards that there would be a reduced administrative burden concerning the survey. So our pitch always included how the survey would be managed by me. Any information needed on a form or a website would be developed by me and any survey questions would be sent my way. But with New Hampshire being one of the only states that renewed on paper instead of online, there had to be some administrative involvement. So at the end of the day, one of the barriers to a true requirement was that administrators would need to work with me to maintain a survey completion status list before issuing the renewal. Um, but since House Bill 322 passed, all of the health professions boards have actually migrated to an online renewal, which means this administrative burden has now been removed and a true requirement would be acceptable to the board administrators. We would basically have a page on the renewal form with the survey link and instruction on where to locate the opt-out form. Providers would then have to check to certify that they have completed the survey or the opt-out form before submitting payment for renewal. But this would all be done electronically without an administrative hand in it. We also developed the survey to be as user-friendly as possible, avoiding the collection of sensitive data um, and ensuring it wasn't too time-consuming. So our survey software vendor, Qualtrics, allows for skip logic, so only questions relevant to the respondent are presented. And just for example, if a respondent answered 
that they were a U.S. citizen. We don't ask about J-1 waiver participation. If they don't practice at an outpatient setting, those questions are skipped, et cetera. And once a respondent completes the survey, the next time they enter the site, certain questions like demographics and education and training will be pre-populated to save the respondent time. Providers will always have the option to complete the opt-out form, which we actually crafted to still provide us with data components necessary to complete our work as a PCO. So we'll collect data on MPI, currently practice specialties, active practice status, and locations of physical practice site or sites, um, but it will only take about a minute. Finally, support from stakeholders is really paramount for survey implementation success. So we're fortunate enough to have this project strongly supported by a former New Hampshire representative who chairs the Legislative Commission and who's still very politically active and well-respected. She's maintained her relationships with those in the legislature and garnered support for this initiative. Um, she finds sponsors and presents to associates on the desperate need for this data. We've had the opportunity to present to and gain additional support from other legislative commissions, um, rural affairs and commission on healthcare and community support workers who have added our initiative and recommendations on their annual reports. And, you know, healthcare workforce is a hot topic in the state, as I assume it is for many other states out there, too. Um, so we have general support from our state government, especially considering how there's no fiscal note with this initiative. My position is paid for, for from our federal grant using general funds. Um, I'm sorry. My position is paid for from the federal grant, and then the Qualtrics software is, is paid for using general funds from the SOAR budget. And finally, it's, it's key that support is gained from provider boards and associations. So we have a strong message, again, that we will manage the project and do our part to limit any burden on the boards as best we can. We manage ongoing communication and follow-up to keep our partners up to date with successes and challenges um, and always ask for feedback on ways to improve. We communicate with all of our stakeholders that aggregated data will be provided if requested. And although I released a visualization report using Tableau um, that we actually just started this year, I can cut the data different ways to meet their needs. And so we're quick to remind them of this every time uh, we meet. Also, I strive to have providers understand the need and keep them happy. I think at first, for, for some, another requirement can be a shock. And then, you know, when the initiative is appreciated and understood, at the end of the day, it's still another thing on their plate. So it's important to have a project contact to respond to questions and concerns how, as they come in. Um, I found that a human touch to things has really made the difference and providers appreciate a thoughtful response. So uh, that's really it. I'm, I'm hoping that at this time next year, we'll be able to present on our truly required survey implementation and all the successes that come with it. But as you've heard, there's still a lot to be done, even in our sixth year of the survey implementation process. But to all states that are pursuing this or um, are interested in this topic, you can always reach out to me. Um, I've provided my email and, and phone number on the last slide, as well as our Health Professions Data Center website link. Um, and that provides sort of the rationale and goals of the project, who we're surveying, and our legislative um, authorization bills in there too. Um, and then lastly, the report that we just released that we're really excited about because Tableau gives really great visualizations of this data, um, and you can sort of play with it a little bit too so that you can drill down on um, different graphics to look at primary care um, and things like that. So please feel free to reach out if, if you would like and, and check out our resources. Thank you, Daniel. I think this is really valuable information, you know, even without knowing the outcome of the legislation yet, I think it's important for states to be informed of the process and, you know, the potential barriers involved and how to tackle them. And I think, you know, these resources that you have here are great for states that are considering going forward with this process and this legislation. Yeah, so, absolutely. Okay, so it looks like we do have time for a few questions. First question is, have there been any detractors along the way from the board or individual providers? 
Um, so, you know, once I explain to providers the need for data um, and how it helps the workforce as well as the state, and that we don't have it elsewhere, usually they come around. Many providers believe that this information is already maintained by the Board of Medicine or it can be obtained from um, some of some, you know, public resource, but, you know, which is true, but I have to explain the need to have this information stored in one repository because we don't have the capacity in this office. I don't have the capacity to Google, you know, and tap into other databases like the MPI database, which is notoriously inaccurate um, for each component for each individual providers. And, you know, actually, this is the first year we have implemented surveying with the PAs, and surprisingly, there was more pushback from them than there was from physicians. And physician surveying is required in many other states, but this hasn't been the case yet for PAs. So I think, you know, again, there can be that the shock that comes with it um, if they're not used to a rule like this and nobody likes, you know, requirement language. Um, and again, like even when it's understood, it's still something else on their plate. So it's just important to have that human touch, to have somebody, I mean, I make sure even if I'm out of the office and I, you know, we're in, we're, it's during a renewal cycle that um, I either provide information on my voicemail, on um, my email, or I make sure to get back regardless within 24 hours because I have had good response from that where people can seem upset and that providers can seem upset initially, but once they, you know, once somebody talks to them and spends time emailing or talking through on the phone, you know, they understand that this isn't just, um, you know, the systematic state-run thing, that there's a human behind this and, and, you know, willing to talk through it. And also you heard there were detractors in the legislature during the legislative process. But again, we're hoping that with online migration and that reduced burden for all will gain broad support, especially considering how there's the option to complete the opt-out form. So it's not, you know, you have to you have to complete the survey or you're not getting your license. It's you complete the survey and provide all this rich information or please complete the opt-out form where you're providing, you know, the minimum information that's necessary that would take a minute or less um, to complete. And, and again, this is, this is um, becoming more and more popular across the country. So this, for, especially for physicians, you know, this shouldn't be the first time they're hearing of something like this, especially if, if um, they have licensure in other states. I know that Vermont has something like this and, um, this Maine, Maine has something like this. So I think it's just, you know, coming around to the idea and understanding how essential it is and, um, you know, just staying on top of it. And like you said, having, you know, someone that you can pick up the phone and talk all this through with, I'm sure that helps. Exactly. Exactly. There's nothing worse than when you're a frustrated provider and, you know, you make a phone call or an email and then you you don't get a response. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oftentimes that just is the case where it takes a few days and especially if there's a high volume of um, inquiries. But I, I mean, there have been times when this first started where I would come into work and there would be over 50 emails of, you know, is this legitimate? Um, how do I know that this isn't spam? And why do you need this? And don't, you know, doesn't the board already have this information? And can't you get it elsewhere? And um, so, yeah, it is important. And, and again, I found, you saw with the 88% response rate that that was helpful. You know, at the end of the day, we had to say, this is going to be a requirement tied to licensure, but, you know, we expect this to come into place before the end of the renewal cycle. So you don't have to do it now, but it's possible you won't, you know, get your license um, if you don't by the close. So they were motivated to do it, but there could be plenty that said, well, I'm going to take my chances. And a lot of those, I think, you know, with that human touch said, oh, you know, let me just, let me just go ahead and do this. And, and I've also, I have a smile folder, it sounds silly, but of providers who actually say, you know, I can't believe you respond. Thank you so much for your prompt response. And this means a lot. And I, I totally get it. I wanted to make sure this was legitimate. And so I see, you know, just even in their words that it makes a big difference. Okay. Let's see. Next question. What will be the next steps if this legislation does not pass? So 
Now, we've been doing this for a while, for a few years, and we would most likely wait another legislative cycle and pursue again with an amendment to the bill um, because, again, what we're currently pursuing or what others are on behalf of us is this amendment, but it's through this huge bill that has all these different components tied to it. Um, and so it could get messy. It could take longer than um, than expected. And, you know, we just, we really have high hopes that with this um, streamlined process of being online that those naysayers will come around to it and really accept the initiative. So uh, we're hoping that, you know, we're able to go through with this one. If not, we, we will um, just pursue an amendment to the bill next time around. You know, but if we find ourselves running in circles, we just, we have to focus our energy elsewhere and drop the initiative. Um, you know, we just, we don't have the capacity in this office to to get a dearth of data and put out sort of useless, meaningless data, you know, just for fun. We have to use this for our, um, for requirements. And so if it's not, if it's really just running us into the ground and we're not getting anything out of it, we would have to look elsewhere and um, and drop this and see if there's any other way of probably just focusing on the shortage des designation piece and primary care to focus our energy and efforts. But yeah, again, we're in a good position for the amendment, so uh, the latter is really the worst case scenario. But you know, we don't have much money in the office, as I'm sure a lot of other um, PCOs and SORs um, are, and are, you know, if our, this initiative doesn't provide us with meaningful data, then, um, then, then what's the purpose? So we're not willing to do just good enough. We want to really be the state resource that provides this data and not just do it again for shortage designation, but to do it for all those other cool things that other stakeholders need instead of having it, you know, sort of piecemeal throughout the state. We want it in this coordinated, centralized office. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have. Thanks for presenting on this topic and sharing your experiences. I think it's been really helpful. Thank you, Morgan. I appreciate it. I had fun. And thank you out there for attending our webinar. Just to let you know, we will be posting our slides shortly to our website. So if you want to download them, check back very quickly at healthworkforcet.org. We hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, and have a good day.